All right, so welcome back. If you uh, if you were here on the stream for the very laggy couple of seconds that you were here before, um, you might have caught a little bit of that. Um, but uh, I'm so thrilled to have um, our amazing guest here with us today, Matthew Smith, co-founder and CEO of Mizuma Go. How is it going, Matthew? Hey, it's going good. Just, uh, you know, another day. Yeah, and I'm realizing I love that every time that I change something around, it uh, decides that it's like, nope, we don't want to. <laughs> we don't. Want, we don't want to do it that way. Are you seeing like what I'm changing around here? It's like little things. Yeah, it's very unhappy with the, me. You're on the UVic internet. Yeah, we definitely are. Um, anyway, so um, so if this is your first time tuning into Q and A Corner, um, welcome. Uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of the spiel that I would have done before, but I wanted to make sure that we got. Matthew on here right away so I could make sure that everything was working. So you are here on Q&A Corner, uh, interactive industry interviews presented by High Tech U, an initiative of the University of Victoria Faculty of Engineering and Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. My name is Andrew. Um, I am the co-founder of High Tech U and also your host for today um, as we go through our um as we go through our amazing interview. So I am gonna turn it back over to our amazing guest, Matthew, to say a little bit about himself um, and uh, while I make sure that everything is working on the back end. So uh, I'm gonna go back over here and then go straight on to you. And Matthew, like, do you wanna just tell tell our viewers a little bit about yourself? Oh man, that's a... That's a very broad, open-ended question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm Matthew. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders at Mizumigo. Um, I started the company sort of out of UVic as a student. Um, and there's, a, I guess there's a long story there. <laughs> um, I studied computer science at UVic. Um, so uh, part of what I do at the company is a lot of technical work as well as sales and um, a bunch of uh, banking stuff as well. So um, I don't know, what do I do in my spare time? Uh, I recently started rock climbing, uh, which I really like. And um, yeah, that's a bit about me. I know that broad question is hard. I was going to say that is like, the, it's the worst question to ask somebody. Um, but um, I will, uh, I will ask a better one. I promise. So I'm interested. Uh, so your journey into the world of tech um, has it sounds like when, so so for those of you who are on the stream, um, Matthew and I got the chance to connect a couple weeks ago, actually, for the first time. And I was like, hey, are you willing to be on, um, on Q&A Corner? Because I think you've got a really cool story. So I'm interested if like you might be able to share your story about how you got from sort of that high school experience to where you are. And that's, a, I know it's a long time, but like from that high school experience to where you are now um, running a tech company here in Victoria. Yeah, so... I guess I, I'm 27, um, so thinking back, I guess, I don't know, whatever, uh, nine years from when I finished high school. Uh, so when I finished high school, I didn't do very well in high school. Um, I was sort of uh, busy hanging out with friends, but um, when I graduated, I, I took a year off and went traveling uh, and did a bit of a volunteering uh, stint as well. So I volunteered in Fiji for six months. And then when I got back, I was trying to figure out sort of like what to do with my life and, and what I wanted to what I wanted to do for a job. And so I ended up going to Camosun uh, and doing a little bit of upgrading, but taking a lot of economics. So I did a diploma in economics for two years at Camosun. And then I actually applied to the business program at UVic. Um, and I didn't get in, which is kind of hilarious and ironic now. Um, so I didn't get into the business program, but I transferred to UVic and I uh, took a little bit of economics and I took one computer science course and just loved it. I loved that um, it was all about solving problems and I didn't have to write essays and I could just, you know, write my code or answer my math questions. And like, for me, that was like the ideal experience. I didn't want to have to like do a lot of, uh, do a lot of writing in school. I, I really liked just solving problems. Um, so I ended up just studying computer science um, until about 2018. So sort of like three years into my comp sci degree and I needed co-ops. And so, um, I was applying for all kinds of computer science co-op jobs. And for those of you in engineering or computer science, or I guess even business, you know that getting your first co-op is, is the hardest. And uh, I never managed to get my first co-op, actually. Uh, I kept applying to places and just couldn't get it. And so I thought, um, why don't I just start my own company? Um, 
And uh, funny enough, like I, I realized that if I took student loans and um, got grants for for, um, for hiring co-op students, I could actually hire myself and hire uh, three of my friends and then start a company with with um, by doing that. So that's actually kind of what I did. I, I took student loans and then I got a bunch of grants and ended up, uh, you know, creating a co-op for myself and hiring three of my friends. Uh, and that was sort of like January 2018. Um, and we, we spent like four months basically just messing around. Uh, you know, I think we were playing video games at work sometimes. Um, and we were trying to build this marketplace thing that has nothing to do with what we do now. Um, but just a lot of, it was a lot of learning and self and like teaching myself how to, how to do the company thing. Um, we sort of carried that. I ended up somehow extending that co-op for a long time. So I did like three more co-ops like that. And I guess around, um, Sort of, I spent the year of like 2018 just like failing at a whole bunch of different ideas. Um, I managed to get tons of grants and sort of like outside money to keep funding my experiments. That's a whole other story. <laughs> um, and uh, sort of like January 2019, I had this crazy epiphany where I was like, uh, after selling to all these businesses and trying to get them to use our my other failed ideas... Um, I realized that there was a common pattern that they all had issues with payments and that processing payments was actually a really big pain in the pain in the butt. Um, and so I sort of started down this journey of talking more about payments to businesses, how they process payments, what are they doing? And for those of you that are, you know, students or still in school, you probably don't realize it, but, um, the payment system we have today in North America is very restrictive based on the amount of money you're trying to move around. So you can imagine if you're, let's say you're a larger business, like a construction company, and you're trying to collect, you know, $50,000 invoices, there's actually not a lot of ways that you can collect that money, right? So there, you know, you can take a check or an e-transfer or a wire transfer, or they can somehow, you know, EFT the money into your account, but it's not as simple or nearly as simple as an an e-transfer. And obviously, I'm sure some of you have hit e-transfer limits and know um, if you're trying to pay somebody 50 grand, it's not really feasible to send e-transfers for two months straight to try and pay that invoice. Um, so really dove into that in 2019. And then I guess in, in sort of like May, June, um, I managed to get a, a relationship, a, a banking relationship with the Bank of Montreal. And uh, we ended up building a really awesome banking infrastructure to allow uh, no limit transactions. And essentially the goal, the idea was to make it as easy as an e-transfer, um, but with no limits and really directed towards businesses that had this, this problem. Um, I took all my learnings from 2018 and of all the failures and sort of uh, pushed everything into this idea and this this kind of new this new start. Um, and so we launched that in September 2019. Um, and if, I guess if you kind of move, uh, we had like a closed beta sort of between September 2019 and March 2020. And then March 2020, we launched more publicly. And I guess if I'm like fast forwarding a year, we sort of went from like, zero customers and processing maybe like a couple hundred grand a month to, you know, now we're processing um, in the tens of millions. Uh, and it's it's kind of insane, actually. Um, yeah, so I mean, we're, you know, we're set to process over $100 million this year. And, um, you know, we're, we, we're signing up more and more customers every month. And uh, things have sort of just like gone uh, in a crazy direction that I, I didn't, I didn't know if we were going to make it there or not. But you know, I'm pretty now that we're here, it feels a little bit different. How's awesome. The lag on that? <laughs> no, it's actually not that bad. I uh, um, it, it does it seem? How does it seem on your end? It was actually looking pretty good on mine. I'm like on Twitch right now, I'm just double checking. Everything looks really delayed on my view. I don't know, but that maybe it's just Zoom. Let's let's assume let's assume that it's Zoom. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, I was literally just jumping in here to check. It's you know what it is. It's so funny. It's literally just my uh, my second screen is uh, is it does not like that second screen. The whatever the driver is that it's running is is my computer is very oh, no. upset. But that's okay. I don't need the second screen. I can make it work with one. Um, so no, that's amazing. And that's such a crazy journey that is not kind of one that you would expect. And, and the title, I don't know if you saw, I'm sure you did. The title of um, this stream was actually, um, what does a pivot actually look like in the tech industry? And so I know you, you kind of mentioned that it wasn't, you were building a marketplace and it's not 
nothing like what you've actually ended up building. So like, I'm curious in, in, in like that, that's an awesome kind of full journey, but I'm really interested in like adding a magnifying glass into that pivot from okay, we're doing this thing, but now that's not a thing that's like providing value anymore. Like what, what did that process look like? Cause I imagine it probably wasn't particularly smooth. Uh, so I think, it, I mean, it's different depending on what stage you're at. For us, we actually never, I never got to launch the marketplace. Like we never really launched this thing, right? We, um, we, I, you know, we spent a whole bunch of time building software and we had like little pieces of things that we would try and release but i don't think i don't we never in that year in 2018 i never had like a full-fledged it's it's interesting we never fully like i never fully fulfilled the requirements of that idea and launched it um sort of along the way of, of you know meeting people and understanding i guess how companies work and how especially high growth tech startups work um i sort of learned that that was a bad idea <laughs> um, and not really an idea worth solving. And I guess like during my journey, I learned how to find problems that were worth solving. And I learned how to evaluate a problem from not only just like, a, oh, I think this is a cool idea, but from, you know, do people have this problem and are they willing to pay for a solution for it? How difficult is the solution to build? What's the, what's the minimal version of the solution that people are willing to pay for? You know, how much is it going to cost for us to build that and how fast can we get it into people's hands? It's not just that, but how much does it cost to sell that thing? And then how much are people willing to pay for it? And knowing that, oh, okay, it, there's, there's a market here and it's, it's less, I think it changes from more, it changes from being some crazy idea you have that you think is a good idea to, um, is there, is this, you know, being able to evaluate the market and knowing is there a market for this product and, and thinking about it from an economic standpoint rather than a, a very like personal my idea standpoint. Uh, it's funny that you talk about this idea. And I mean, it's something that people I, I don't th and we had a conversation with this the other day. So I'm kind of trying to like replicate our conversation the other day that people don't necessarily think about when they're building out an, an idea initially is the is the ability to get that into somebody's hands in a way that they're really going to want to to pay for it. So do you I mean, you obviously see a lot of sort of very talented people like technically talented that are coming through. Do you ever meet or have you met people that are, are coming through there that they have this brilliant idea, they can bring it from idea to an actual thing, but it's something that nobody wants and they just can't quite let go of that. Is that something that you've experienced or seen? Um, I, I'm trying to think of a, a direct example, but um, I can't think of a direct example, but I think what oftentimes, especially with technical founders like myself, what often gets misplaced or left to the back burner at some point is um, the sales process and like what is the most important part about a company. You know, a company has to make money to survive. And so the sort of... Are you, a, are you a dev shop or are you a sales engine? And so how do you sort of like bring the company to the point of being a, this like sales and growth engine? Because really startup is, you know, why Combinator I think point this of like startup being growth, right? Startups are growth. And so if you're not growing every month and getting new customers and people like trying to get this thing from you that you're building, um, you know, maybe you're not building something people want. And so, you know, I think it comes back to, you um, Maybe it comes back to like being able to test something really quickly to know if people want that thing, you know? Um, and I think maybe we, we did talk about that last week where I said, you know, if someone has an idea, you know, uh, try and sell it, not try and sell it, but maybe try and get people on a waiting list or like talk to people and tell them about it first before, you know, going and, you know, paying for all this code to be done. I think if you're, but I don't know, there's a weird, there's a weird twist there. If you're a young computer science student, uh, I definitely recommend if you have an idea and it's not going to take you forever, like there's a start and a finish line that you can see. I mean, just go build that thing. You know, I don't think there's a negative downside. You know, if you're like, just want to just want to if you have extra time and you just want to build this thing, go build it. Right. And then see what happens. Um, but if you're you know, if you're trying to start a business and, you know, you're trying to get customers, I think there's a different approach. Um, to, to figuring out what the right idea is. And as an engineer, there's nothing wrong with like 
building something quickly, throwing it out there, building another thing quickly, throwing it out there. If you're a business student or you don't have the technical know-how to build, you know, build engineering stuff and you're thinking about borrowing money or raising money to build some software, well, you know, you better have some good data or you better have some pre-sales or something like that, uh, you know, to, to be able to prove that this thing is real, right? Um, I have seen, you know, I won't name people, obviously, but I have seen companies where there's no one really technical on the team and they have this grandiose vision and then they go out there and spend a way too much money building a bunch of random stuff to try and get to this point. Um, and they never get there and they just sort of either keep borrowing or raising more money to try and get there. Um, and I think, you know, having someone technical early on is, is super important to be able to, you know, build and iterate. I mean, I can't think just looking at Mizumigo today, even in the last year and a half, I mean, we've rebuilt a few of the software stacks from scratch, like multiple times already, right? And wow. it takes like a, a technical team to be able to do that. Um, yeah, so I don't know. There, no matter what you do, it's going to be hard. <laughs> See, that's so true. Okay, so I it's funny. So every every single time that we do one of these streams, there's always like little angles that I'm interested in going down. And so um, we talked on a stream recently about this idea of sort of what is venture capital um, with somebody who was sort of at the very beginning of that stage. They hadn't raised a huge amount. Um, for you, because obviously with Mizumigo, you've you've now raised some money for it. What is the, what's that process like as a, as a first time founder or an early founder? Is it intimidating? Is it something that you need to make sure that you have specific things? Did you get kind of laughed out of the room at all? Like what was that experience like for you building a company that you're then trying to get VC to fund? Yeah. So, I mean, I was always, even in 2018, I was trying to get investment. So I think the earliest time I tried to get investment was sort of like April, 2018, when we had nothing. And I was, I think it was like 20, I don't know, maybe I was 24 and um, trying to get conversations with investors about investing in this thing. And obviously the biggest mistake I made was that, you know, thinking that investors are going to give me money for something that I have no customers for. Right. Um, I think that was like the biggest thing I learned in 2018 is like people are not going to give you money for something you have no customers for. Now there's obviously there's niche things that that maybe that's not true. Maybe you have some crazy new technology that, you know, is just, it's so obvious, you know, I built a, a teleporter, right. And I don't have any customers for my teleporter yet, but I can show you that it teleports stuff, you know, give me money. I'm sure you'll get investment. Right. Um, totally. But if you're trying to build some, like if you're trying to build some software company, for example, a marketplace for services, which is what I was trying to do in, eight, in 2018, nobody is gonna give you any money unless you have some significant proof that people are gonna use it and you have the ability to build this thing. Um, I was so dismayed by not getting investment in 2018 and I had learned that lesson too hard that I didn't try and raise money again. I actually never tried to raise money again. So in 2019, after we had built like the actual prototype of our tech and had a customer, a couple customers using our software doing, you know, we were processing maybe a hundred grand in September and then 200 in October, 2019 um, with these early customers. Actually, we needed some, we needed some like compliance thing or something. I needed like 20 grand, I needed like $20,000 and I was trying to borrow the money. So we were actually doing side contracts to get a little bit of revenue. Um, so we were building software for other people and, uh, I needed like 20 extra grand. And I, so what I did is I went to, you know, an investor and I said, Hey, can I borrow $20,000 from you? I have this contract that guarantees me 40 grand in the next six months. You know, I'm, I'm definitely going to be able to pay you back. You know, I can give you whatever interest rate on the money. And the investor actually just turned around and said, Oh, uh, I won't lend you money, but I'll just invest in you. And I was like, I was like, Oh, what? And I, and I guess like a, a switch, had flicked because before I'd been so like, I had learned that lesson before too hard. And now I was like, Oh wow, I actually, I have customers now. I have a product. Um, I can actually raise money now. Like I can actually get investment. And so there was like a, a switch that flicked sort of in the fall of 2019 where I could go out there and raise money. And so instead of getting 20,000, I ended up getting 150,000 in the fall of 2019. That's and, wild. You know, we, we, we took that money, um, and we, we hired, um, we hired Miriam, who's our marketing manager, in sort of like, you know, January 2020. 
And then we ended up building out a whole bunch of stuff that we needed to really publicly launch in March 2020, a bunch of compliance stuff as well. And then um, in April, um, we were looking at really scaling uh, the, after the public launch and had seen tons of uh, interest. And so we raised another about 500 grand in April 2020. Um, and then we took that money and really focused on building some scalable software um, and probably didn't focus on sales as much as we should have in 2020. But we actually went from processing like zero dollars to, you know, we, I think we processed about 20 million dollars in, in 2020. So like zero to 20 million. It was is wow, it was, right? That's uh, huge. And then sort of like January 2021, we just closed sort of like two months ago, we just closed about 900 grand in, in further investment. And I guess you'd call it like our seed or whatever, but um, yeah, that money. So now we are using this money to sort of accelerate our um, sales engine. So we really, I mean, I would say at the end of 2020, we really changed everything from being this like um, software focused uh, company to now a sales focused company. And so everything I do now is very sales focused. Um, and sales driven. Um, I mean, we still develop very cool technology and we're adding lots of stuff to the platform, but um, a lot of it is very focused on, you know, how can we grow this thing as fast as possible? You know, looking at, you know, every month we have to be doing better than we did the previous month. And it's like an intense kind of push. Um, but yeah, I think for us in FinTech, it was easier to raise money than other companies because we're in FinTech and FinTech is very hot right now. So there's a lot of different factors when you're raising money there's like the market like what is the market like for your particular industry um there's a, the difference between angel investors and venture capital corporations and depending on the size of the venture capital corporation so you can imagine like is your company going to be a 50 million dollar company or a 100 million dollar company or are you going to be a billion dollar company and depending on um the model of the venture capital corporation they can only invest in you based on a certain criteria. So sort of early angel investors, well, they're getting such a deal that they don't care if you're just worth $50 million. That's a good return for them. But, you know, as you sort of go in the later stages, unless you're unless you can show that you're going to be worth a billion dollars in the in a good scenario, um, you know, most venture capital corporations, it doesn't actually even make sense to invest in you because they have to get a good enough uh, deal that they can like, you know, 100x their money, or basically they have to return the whole fund with like one really good investment, right? And so they're looking for those opportunities. So it depends if your business, you know, if you're evaluating your business, whether you're, you know, fundable, you may actually not even be fundable, right? Um, it really, it really depends on how big the company can get, what is the market cap on what you can do. And obviously, in fintech, it's just super obvious, because the market cap is just like in the trillions, right? So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really stop. Um, I mean, I don't know if you saw like Stripe the other day, well, Stripe's worth like $90 billion. Yeah, it's crazy. Like yeah. financial, fintech is, I think with the, the new, like the, I guess the more popularity of blockchain now, especially, um, it's bringing, and which is not, it's not fintech block block, like, like Bitcoin is not, is not all that there is in fintech, but you're seeing a lot more of these concepts that are in that area that are starting to drive more interest in conversation. So yeah, but I definitely saw Stripe and I was like, that's insane. Yeah. I mean, it's not just Stripe, right? Like wealth simple in Canada is now starting to dominate a lot of the market. They're coming out with a peer to peer system to try and replace e-transfer. Um, you know, there's a lot of movement in the payment space in North America. North America's payment space is very much behind the rest of the world. I mean, we still use checks in North America. There's so give you perspective. There's 14 and a half billion checks processed every year in North America, and in Europe, there's no checks. So it's just kind of uh, it's kind of insane how far behind we are from the rest of the world. And so there's it, probably in the next 10 years, there's going to be like a lot of um, movement in innovation and technology and how businesses are doing payments in North America and also how businesses are banking in North America as well. Me, right? Uh, you don't really think, I think there's, you do get so centric on where you are that that is the only way that things can go. But I had no idea that Europe, there were no checks. There's only checks in North America. Yeah. Checks are gone, right? Asia, they don't have checks either. Huh. There you go. 
Okay, so then, so that's an interesting shift for you as like this technical founder to go from basically being a SaaS company to now being a sales driven company. What have you found to be like the biggest challenge for that, for that switch for you as like the CEO, but also just maybe as a company um, to make that switch? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we transitioned from, uh, you know, we, we, we had a bit of a staff transition for into that mode as well. Um, and, it, and it really worked out for us in, in sort of switching what is the focus, what's driving the new features that we're building. And really, um, you know, we've adjusted that and changed that driven to more, more like consumer customer feedback and stuff like that. Like, we now have enough customers using our software that we get really good data and analytics. So if we want to figure something out, you know, we can go and look at our analytics platform and understand, okay, how are people doing the payments? You know, are there any, you know, what is the number of clicks to get to this flow and sort of like, okay, you know, even on sales calls, collecting data on sales calls to know like, okay, this is the most in-demand feature we have. This is what we're going to build next. Um, and by being able to sort of use this like sales, almost like sales data and, and um, like, like really scaled customer feedback, we're able to drive product growth, which in turn is going to drive um, the sales of the company. Uh, so it's just, it, it, I think the engineering side helped me a lot because I'm good at like setting up all those data pipelines and things like that and understanding how to like do that stuff really yeah. well. So, I mean, um, but yeah, it, it is a challenge for me personally. I do a lot of what I call context switching. So, you know, my day, like before getting on this call, I was programming, right? So it's sort of like my day is switching between um, sales, checking in with staff, doing, you know, compliance banking stuff to customer support. And then, you know, maybe I'll be programming for a little bit. So it's a lot of like high gear tech switching right now. Um, and maybe that's just because we're, we're still, a, you know, we're still a startup. We, you know, we're a team of, we're a team of seven and we're, we're, we're hiring right now, by the way. We have two co-op positions open and, and a software engineering position open. Um, and so I think right now at the stage we're at, I feel like I do a lot of everything, which is just fine. It's just, uh, yeah, it's always going to be a challenge. I love that. So that's an interesting transition then. I'm curious. So, so talking about sort of hiring students and, and that context switching for you. So obviously in this role as CEO, that's part of the gig, but you're bringing on and always growing your team. And I know the answer to this question because we had a, a long conversation about this last time, but um, what is the thing that you look for in employees? Because it seems that every CEO hiring manager has something different, but I was really, I think your angle that you took on it when we chatted last time was really um was a really interesting one for especially for high school students that are out there that may already be kind of doing some of the stuff that you're that you are looking for but anyways so so what is it that you're looking for in those co-op students and young employees yeah so just to be clear we don't hire computer science or software engineering co-ops um, it's just too much work to train them right now because we're still early stage. But for the business co-op students, we've had a lot of success. Um, and so what we look for is typically some sort of side projects. Um, we actually don't really care about your grades at all. Um, so we don't really look at grades like, yeah, it doesn't matter whatsoever. Um, we don't care, you know, how well you did in, in your, you know, business administration class. Like it's totally useless when you get into a company like ours. Um, what we care about is, have you done things on your own? Have you like, do you have a website? Um, you know, uh, like, like the interns we had, you know, you know, an intern like Charlie, who, who worked for us for the last eight months. Um, he's in the business program at UVic. Um, you know, he had made his own, I think he was selling like graphic or he was selling, um, label art or, uh, something like that for like musicians. Like he was selling, uh, God, what's it called? It's called label art or something like that. Like the, the covers of, of records or whatever yep. he was doing. He was like designing these things and selling them online. And he had like a website that he could show the ones that he had sold to the different artists. And like, that's why we hired him. It was it had nothing to do with anything else. It was like, okay, you know, he's, he's personable. He can, he can have a, a fast paced conversation. Um, he can, you know, he can, he's demonstrated that he's done something on the side. He's not just like coming in there and getting, uh, you know, trying to bank on his good grades to get him a job. Um, I don't know what his grades are like. They're probably okay. I don't know. Charlie, if Charlie's watching, <laughs> he'd be like, my grades are great. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't matter. I think grades don't matter. You know, for me, when I looked at it as a student, it's like, there's, 
if you know what this is, diminishing marginal returns on the amount of effort you put into the to the grade you get, right? So, you know, if you put in minimal effort and you can get Bs, then spend the rest of that extra time doing side projects and you'll be totally fine. Um, especially if you're something like, if you're in something like computer science or whatever, like, oh my God, the amount of extra work you had to do to, to get that A plus in computer science is just like, oh, in my mind, you know, coming from a unique position was not worth it. Um, and I spent my time doing, you know, side projects. Yeah. So, so what for you, like, what was the, what was the side project for you? So when you were going through, what, what, what were some of your, the, what, if you remember them, some of the side projects you were doing, I, I mean, I mean, I guess your side project kind of was div dot too, I guess. Right. My side project ended up being, ended up being div dot. Yeah. So like my side project was, you know, wire, I did a lot of like learning how to wireframe. I really loved human computer interaction. So I did a lot of wireframing. So like building up to doing that co-op, I had to convince the co-op advisors and um, the innovation center at UVic to allow me to do this in the first place. And so I had to do a lot of sort of work on the side to get, you know, wireframes and documentation. And I think I had to write a business plan um, to allow them to even for me to do that co-op. So I think for me, um, that was sort of the side stuff I did. Other than that, I, I was always like messing around with throwing up websites and, and learning how to do stuff like that. Um, React, like React.js was still pretty new when I was doing that in, in 2018. I think it was like three years old in 2018. Um, and so I was like trying to mess around with that. I, I probably didn't, yeah. I don't know, there's there's a lot you can do, <laughs> you know? Um, and what was like, I think we interviewed someone the other day that had done an e-commerce store, like he had built his own e-commerce store. And I don't think it went well, but <laughs> no one cares. I think like, oh, yeah, one of the one of the questions I love asking in interviews is like, tell me your effed up moment. Tell me like something you totally messed up, tell me, like something you totally failed at. Um, and people that actually have a cool answer of something they messed up at, I don't care how bad, like it's not. I just want to know that you failed at something and didn't like. Uh, give up on life, you know, um, the whole point is that, you know, can you show that you've like really tried something other than, and, and you're not allowed to give an answer of something from school. So you have to give something, some failure, failure example of like outside of school. And it could be like, I don't know, sometimes people answer like a sports thing, but the best answers are like, you know, oh, I threw up this website and tried to sell this stuff online and like nobody would buy my stuff. And I wasted a thousand dollars. Like to me, that's like, okay, you're hired. You know, I love that. Um, yeah. So it's so funny, right? This conversation around failure is kind of, it's, it's getting normalized at, at the professional level now. Cause you've got like F up nights, you've got like all of these sort of like events, um, which are awesome, but so much at like the, like certainly at the, at the like younger student level. So whether it's high school students who we deal with or like undergraduate students who are out there, like that fear of failure is so put into you because I guess like you spend $500 on that course and you put your heart and soul into it and then you end up failing the course and you just feel terrible. So like for anybody who's out there watching the stream right now and you're like, I failed a course, um, that's not the only thing you're going to fail in your life and that's okay. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> it's a, like school is a bit of a foul, like the whole thing that they put you through is a bit of a fallacy, right? I mean, you could spend your whole life just going to school and staying in this like you know go do your phd and you'll be in school your whole life like work works much differently than school um and you know the things you know some people some people do terribly in school but they're like the rock stars at, at in industry and and so um you know i would never take i i would not weigh heavily what you're doing in school on where you'll end up and um working in, in a real job is I can tell you from knowing students and like being a student, it's much more fun to not be doing that because every day I get to work on stuff that I actually enjoy. And there's not like, there's no rubric, right? It's not like, Oh, give me the rubric. There's no rubric for this. Um, you know, I don't know. I think, uh, yeah, school's in for some sort of change. They need to change how that's done somehow. I, I don't know if it'll ever happen, but, um, yeah, I think, I think the biggest mistake you can make is just doing a four year degree and expecting to leave there and get a job somewhere. You need to go do a co-op. You need to build something on your own or something on the side. Um, otherwise you're going to, you're going to wake up at the end of that graduation and be like, Oh crap, what do I do now? And you'll be, 
you know, applying for jobs at, at the coffee shop or something, right? Like you'll, yeah. So just like try and spend the time to like, you know, what do you really want to do? Um, you know, and, and, and focus on the, the things that qualify you for jobs rather than, you know, maybe trying always to get a hundred percent in all your courses and, and, and weighing that. I don't, I don't see that as, as success, you know, like, um, and, and, and trust me, you know, your bank account won't see that as success in 10 years either. It's true. And, and I mean, I, so I'm interested, we had this conversation, I don't know if you remember it, but I was like, what if you could change one thing about school, if school could be one thing that would make people successful. So if somebody's trying to like, they're there and they're in school, but they're like, I want to do something different. What would that ideal school look like for you to prepare people better for when they get into a place like Mizuma Go or like DivDot or like any tech company? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it depends what you're taking, right? Obviously, like, math class, there's a way to do math class, and, like, you have to, you have to, like, do the problems and study it and things like that. But I think, um, you know, things like the biz, like, I remember some, some courses just didn't make sense, right? Like, some of the business courses just don't make sense. It's like, why are you doing that? Um, I think, I think, you know, giving, having more open-ended courses of, um, say, you know, for example, like, you're starting a business, um, you know, Go, go create a website and see for your idea and see how many people you can get to fill up your sign up form. You know, there's no rubric. There's no, you know, there's a pass or fail. And the path, maybe the pass or fail is like you, you got a hundred people to sign up for your service, but you know, you may not fail if you don't get a hundred, if you can explain why you didn't get a hundred or some, I don't know. It, maybe there doesn't need to be some rubric. It can just be like, Oh yeah, go do this. Like, and, and, and comparing that to the real world, I mean, for me, it's like, oh yeah, make this company successful, grow this into a successful business. And then every day I have to try and figure out how to do that. Um, and so like, I guess trying to take that for students into like a smaller subset of things that might take like a month at a time, uh, would be a really good way to approach problems, right? It's sort of like, um, you know, I don't know, go build a robot. There's no rubric. There's no like, there's no design materials. Oh, by the way, you could use the internet, which you could YouTube and Google things, and you'd probably be able to figure it out faster than you would if your teacher gave you some, you know, documentation that's 10 years old. Um, so yeah, I would, I think like changing school in, in more that direction. Um, yeah, the pass fail thing. I, it's, it's kind of hard for that system to move away from there, but you know, for people, um, you know, for people that are interested in, in, in tech companies and things like that, the only way to get into it is to just go out there and try things yourself and test things yourself. Um, you know, getting your bachelor of business administration or what, or whatever, or even just the computer science degree is not enough. In, in computer science, you'll need to have those co-ops. You need to have that work experience. You, you should have a GitHub. You should show that you've tried to build something and, and don't kick yourself if you're a bad programmer. Like if you're not good at programming and you figure that out along the way, that's a cool thing to figure out. So go figure out what you are good at and then you can contribute in other ways. Like tech companies is not all about code. There's a lot of stuff that I have to do with growth marketing and growth engineering that has nothing to do with code and that, you know, the best program in the world is terrible at. And uh, some people are just not, you know, so you don't, uh, I think there's like this impulse syndrome with new programmers of like, everybody has to be as good as this guy. And it's totally not true. There's a lot of other jobs that go into tech that has nothing to do with being the most amazing programmer. And, and that's, I think that's, that's a really important thing. So we had yesterday, we had, uh, uh, Veronica Best, who's the director of product at Dispatch. Um, so she's an artist by training, um, and is now sort of doing the, the HCI stuff, the human computer interaction stuff and leading the teams that do that. And, uh, and yeah, like those pieces that you're talking about with wireframing, like you can be really good at that UI piece, um, and maybe be a terrible programmer, but you're right. Like figuring it out early is probably better than going and spending a multi-year, multi-degree to learn that at the very end, right? Yeah. And I mean, there's, you know, you'll figure that out. I guess you can figure that out through the courses you take. So, I mean, school is nice because it gives you this guided tour of things you can do. Um, but trying to draw those things to industry is hard, especially when the university is so behind, right? Like, I remember, you know, when we did our when you're doing courses, uh, oftentimes the university is like three to 10 years behind what's actually going on in the real world. 
And so oftentimes you'll like be like, oh, I did this thing in this course, but most companies don't care because it's too far behind. They want to see that you like went beyond that and did something in your spare time. And if you're wondering like, oh my God, I don't have any spare time. I have to get straight A's. Well, do you have to get straight A's? Could you just be getting B's and then spend your other time on side projects? And like, how is that going to benefit you? You know, I don't know. That's something you'll have to weigh for yourself, I guess. Totally. So then, okay. So then that, then the kind of the difficult question, but obviously one, so you went through Commotion, um, you went through Uvic. Um, so you, you kind of di- saw both worlds for the post-secondary. Um, what did you see as the, um, the benefit, I guess, of that experience? I mean, aside from, I guess, the fact that you were able to kind of found a company through it, but what was the, the real benefit for you? Yeah, so for the record, I actually, I never graduated from computer science, so I still, I think I still have like seven or eight classes left. So I did end up, you know, I did all those co-ops and I extended it as long as the co-op department would let me, um, and then it got really bureaucratic and I uh, couldn't take any more co-ops, they didn't let me. Um, And so I had to, I guess I just sort of dropped out. Um, I probably won't ever finish the the courses, I don't really think I need to at this point. Um, But yeah, I mean, the benefit of the experience of going for me, it was just the social part of it. You know, I, I like people. I like meeting people. I think like, you know, if you're just sitting in your room alone or you're, you know, you're not going to get the same sort of inspiration or those aha moments. Um, you know, the best ideas often come from like, you know, being out there in the world, interacting with people, learning, and then, you know, maybe you have the shower thought or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's honestly, it's just the social part. <laughs> like if I could, if I could say, you know, the benefit, it's like the social part and not just with the students. Like I'm friends with professors at UVic and Mosin that I had, you know, that I really got along with, um, you know, and I occasionally keep in touch with them and, and check in with them. And um, those types of relationships you create with your professors are super important. Um, and uh, so it's not just the social part of the other students, it's the social part of, um, the the other the professors and the TAs and, and people like that and I think um, if I if I could you know that's the only I think real benefit uh, you're, yeah you're paying for the social part um, that's the only part I miss right like you, when you go in all these different classes and you you can meet all these new people versus like you know you're working for one company you know my network now is through work and through work events which obviously have been dead for the last year communities like Viatech and things like that. Um, yeah, but you know, if you're going to school, you're you're going to school to socialize, and so if you're not socializing in school because you're spending all your time trying to get straight A's, well, you're doing it wrong. Trust me. Do you think that that kind of helped prep you for for like when you had because having to interact with so many people could? Do you think that that would have been a thing that you would have been ready for to like go and pitch to um, companies afterwards? Like, could you have gotten that on your own? Um, did did the university experience help you raise that first million dollars? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think it, it's just part of my personality. I think I'm just a, I'm a social person. Um, nothing prepares you for being able to pitch. The only reason I am okay at I'm okay at pitching now and don't like, you know, sweat my shirt off basically is because I've done it so many times, right? Like I've I've pitched my business thousands of times, and so I can go and pitch to anyone now. I, you know, I'm probably more comfortable. I'm more comfortable going and pitching to an investor now than I am going on like a date, you know, like, <laughs> like I get, Fair more enough. Nervous on a fir- get more nervous on a first date than I would going and meeting an investor uh, and doing a pitch. I, I think I, but I've done it enough times to get to that point, you know? Totally. No, I definitely get it. And you know, I, I, I see it cause you know, that mission, like you live, breathe and eat that mission of Mizuma Go every day. Right. So, um, so where, what's next on that journey? So you pivoted an entire company, um, to like a financial technology world. You've raised all this money. What is next for, for the company? Like where, where are you hoping to go with it? Yeah, so um, there's been like a big movement in sort of digital banking. And so um, our next kind of thing that we're looking at at, uh, tackling is small business bank accounts. Um, So right now we do payments for SMBs um, and we're really trying to bring a very modern experience to payments. Um, One of the biggest things we learned in the last year from doing that is that it's very difficult to bring the, the, you know, what do you call, like, I don't know if you've heard Airbnb, the CEO, he does this, uh, I can't remember his name, but the... I know his name, is it Joe or, anyway, but 
he has this like 10 star experience um analogy where he talks about like what's the airbnb 10 star thing and then let's work backwards from there and so when we were thinking about that from Azumigo and how to make the payments the best, the only way to bring the best banking experience to small businesses is to obviously be the bank. Um, we can't necessarily be a bank in Canada. There's a specific, you know, kind of not a hack, but a way that we can uh, make uh, a very digital banking experience for customers and allowing them to open bank accounts through our system. Um, and so sort of the next thing for us is being... Um, uh, the first digital SMB bank in Canada. It's just kind of what our goal is. That's amazing. So what uh, what do you think is sort of the the best uh, the best advice that you wish you could have given yourself when you were getting into this journey? So when you started down this pathway um, of becoming a founder, a co-founder, a CEO, um, what do you wish that you could have told yourself at the beginning of this cycle um, to prep yourself for where you are now? Uh, that's a hard question because, it, you know, if I hadn't have done all the things I've done to date, then I, maybe I wouldn't be here and I want to be here. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess, um, yeah, I think if I was telling yeah, advice to myself or to someone else, um, I think just fail faster, you know, like, like, uh, I spent way too much time on that first idea um, and I should have just failed much faster than I did. Uh, and so, you know, when I'm giving, if I'm giving advice to, to people, it's like, uh, you know, kill your babies or whatever you want to say, <laughs> whatever you, expression you want to give, you know, uh, you know, just fail faster. Like, you know, it shouldn't take you a year to figure out that a startup or an idea isn't going to work. It should take you a couple of weeks or a month. Right. Um, and you can test those things. There's, there's kind of hacks to testing things. And so, you know, for the other entrepreneurs out there, if you're, you know, if you're sitting on your idea for years and years, um, just drastically change something. Dra if you have no customers, then there's no risk, right? Like if you have no customers and you have this idea that you're sitting on, you've, you're gone like a year or six, even six months and there's no progress, like drastically consider that there's something wrong there and, you know, change something entirely. And, and, you know, it becomes after you have customers, like I know this now, after you have a lot of customers and you have people like stakeholders using your application, it becomes much more difficult to change things. In fact, like when we change stuff, people get upset, right? So it's like, um, when you have no customers, it's so much easier to just like change something and have like be able to, to, yeah. So, you know, I would just like, fail much faster, change what you're doing, you know, bring, it's not personal. If someone doesn't like your idea, it's not personal. They're not attacking you. Um, don't, you know, the other thing is like, which I see a lot, don't turn yourself into a victim, right? Don't make it so that it's about you. It's not about you, right? Um, and I think people tend to do that a lot. If some investor says no to you, or you're not able to raise money, you know, I hear this thing of like, oh, I can't raise money in Victoria, or I can't raise money in Canada. Uh, they just don't understand. Investors are different here. I'm like, are you sure? Like, are you sure that's what it is? I don't think that's what it is, right? I think you need to like evaluate your idea. And if people take that personally, that's a problem. So you kind of got to separate yourself from that and think, you know, it's not personal. I'm not the victim. You can fail and have a bad idea. That's okay. Um, and I see far, far too often and even experience that. My, I did that mistake myself where I took it personally, right? And so I see that a lot. Um, yeah, don't, don't be the victim, you know, nobody's attacking you. Um, just try and figure it out and change your idea and iterate. Yeah. I love that. And it's funny. So I was going to, I was actually going to, so I always save like this really juicy question for the end, but you kind of answered it in there. And like, it was more um, like, what's if there, if you could give advice to a, to like a high school student today um, of like the one piece of advice, the most salient thing, if they're, if they, if they've just tuned into the stream now and they are there, they want to catch the whole thing, but they're not sure if it's worth it. What's your most salient piece of advice just for a student, not necessarily wants to build a business, but just for a student who wants to be successful um, in the world of technology? Yeah, I would say um, treat every job you have like it's the best job you've ever had. Um, you know, whether you're working at a coffee shop, you're working at a restaurant, 
um, you know, no job is beneath you. And so like treat every job, like it's the best job you've ever had. And, uh, you'll, you'll, there's, you cannot go wrong with that, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 um, <laughs> the other one, I guess is like this kind of going back to it. It's like, nobody is trying to attack you. Most people are actually pretty nice and genuine and want to help. Um, and, and, uh, the more approachable you are and the more open to feedback you are, like your glass isn't full kind of thing. Um, the more you'll be able to absorb information from around you and learn and grow very quickly. Um, you know, the more closed off and the more you take things personally, um, you know, the more you'll find you're going to hit lots of roadblocks and, uh, you'll have to learn the hard way, which, you know, that's a route to go. I've been there. Uh, but yeah, I guess my advice, yeah, treat, you know, treat every job like it's the best job you've had. That's awesome. And I love like fail fast too. Like there's some, there are some very quotable, very clippable moments in this, which I will be able to pull out. Um, so, uh, so hard to believe we actually were at all, we're, we're a little bit over our time actually, which I always feel bad That's about okay. going over. Um, but, uh, I want to, um, just, uh, first off say thank you so much, Matt. That was amazing. And like such a cool journey. And I think a unique perspective that a lot lot of people are sometimes afraid to communicate out about like what that experience is and I think that's one of the reasons that I loved our conversation like last week or two weeks ago and I think why I think this is such a valuable stream for people out there um, just because there's some pieces of gold that are in what you said about the education system but a lot of these pieces that I think um, hopefully people will take to heart and take advantage of these things yeah I know that's awesome I, I hope so and um, you know I'm still figuring it out. I haven't figured out all of the pieces of the puzzle of how to make this, you know, you know, whatever billion dollar company that I'm trying to build. Um, and so it's, it's a constant learning, constant failing. And, uh, I'm just trying to absorb as much information as I can and work hard to get there. Um, you know, there, whatever's like every overnight success is like whatever th thousands of nights or I, I can't remember the expression, but, you know, there is no overnight success. I was a crazy guy with an idea until all of a sudden I wasn't. Um, and so, you know, for the guys that feel like they're the crazy guy with the idea, you know, eventually it, it might flip. <laughs> That's good. So just keep going with that idea. You could be there, but if you're not going to get there, fail quicker so that you uh, yeah. so you don't invest too much time into it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so if you're just catching the stream, if you've caught the end and you're like, ooh, this is some really good advice. Who is this guy? What's this all about? We've been here today, um, High Tech U Q&A Corner with Matthew Smith, uh, CEO and co-founder of Mazuma Go, formerly DivDot, um, talking about financial technology, journey into the tech industry, uh, university, college, what education is all about. We've gone all over the place on this stream today. Um, but if you're here at the end, we're just finishing up. So uh, you can still get in touch though, because you're catching this on Twitch, then you can catch this on YouTube. And if you're catching this on YouTube, um, then you've already gotten to the end and seen a lot of the great things. But if you got some questions, um, you can put them in the comments below. I'll make sure they get over to Matthew. Um, and uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about Matthew, you if you're catching the end of this and you're like am i really want to do this we've got a bio up on our website also if they want to find you where can they find you online uh i don't have any social media but they can find me on linkedin i guess that's my other advice you shouldn't have any social media uh if you're trying to build a career or i don't i don't know it's weird advice but i i only have linkedin i don't have any other social media so they can find me on linkedin totally hey listen and you know what it's your linkedin that we actually have linked on your profile so um if you're interested in getting in go. touch with matt uh his linkedin profile is linked on the high tech U website so high tech u.ca the link right down at the bottom down there um look for uh q a corner with matthew and you will be able to uh find out how how to get in touch. So with all that said, I always like to give our guests the very last word on the show. Um, but I do want to say again, thank you so much, Matthew. And thank you to all of our viewers who tuned in, tuned in today. Um, so uh, Matt, over to you for the final words to all of our viewers. Oh man, I got to go another final word. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in. And um, yeah, hope, I hope some of the information that I'm sharing was was valuable, and uh, you know you can learn learn from some of the stuff that I that I failed at.
<laughs> Amazing. So thank you, everybody. Thanks again, Matt. Be kind, be healthy, be safe. Thank you for being here. And we'll see you next time here on Q&A Corner presented by High Tech U. Bye, everybody. Thanks.